Good morning, everyone. Not everything here. I still got it, Timothy. I didn't throw it away. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's see if I can find my faith fest people. I'm going to be one sunburned and tired. Is that you guys? Sounds like it was a good time. We didn't get a chance to be there for it. But we saw the pictures and stuff and uh, a good time. Uh, so, uh, great thing I have about grandchildren is uh, allowing them to run into your arms and everything and bend down and everything. bad thing about grandchildren is they keep running full blast when they're five years old and not two years old. And this one decided to knock my glasses off this morning. <laughs> I think, well, that's on me because I've always told Anna, just run straight to Paw Paw, and she did. So, uh, anyway, so this morning uh, we are back in Genesis. Uh, I appreciate Jeremy helping me out here. Uh, he asked me, he says, What's the title of your, your message? He said, You know, Fry had one and Timothy had one. I went, uh, I don't know. I said, I was trying to get through the verses. I didn't even think about a title, but it's Salvation by Faith. We're in chapter 15 of Genesis. Um, Still looking at Abram. Um, as we've gone through Genesis, especially now that we've started in chapter 12 and, and gone here, uh, and looking at the life of Abram as he becomes Abraham and becomes the father of a nation and a father of people and our spiritual father. Uh, a couple of things that I've kind of thought about during this time. One thing I had mentioned to our class last Sunday a lot of times when we, read the, we get to read the Bible, and as we're reading the Bible, we forget we're seeing the back story. Uh, these events have already happened, and as we read them, and we kind of look back and go, what was you thinking there, Abram? What was you thinking doing that? And that's because we, we have that hindsight. We have the ability to look and see that, yes, God's going to keep his promise, and God's going to do this. But they didn't have that. The second thing is, Abram didn't know that God was going to put this down in words, and on September 1st, 2019, we were going to stand here and talk about him. He was living life at that time, and he was doing something that God had told him to do and trying to obey God. God, through his Holy Spirit, through Moses, writes this stuff down so we have it. But again, how would you like it? And if you're dealing with God, and he's dealing with you, and a few thousand years later, he writes your story down for other people to read about and go, well, what was Keith thinking doing that? So sometimes we've got to give these people, I mean, they, they were live people. They walked on the same earth we walked on, but they were at a point. All he was trying to do was follow God. That's what Abram was doing. So we're going to hopefully get through all of chapter 15. I, we'll see. Uh, there is a part of chapter 15 that is, is, is groundbreaking, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential. And we may rest there. We'll see. Um, so I'm seeing if I'm going the right way here. Oh, nope. I'll learn this thing one of these days. Genesis 15, chapter, or chapter 15, verse 1 says this. says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. So remember, if you remember last week, Timothy talking, uh, Abram's gone to war with these kings. He has defeated these kings and rescued, rescued Lot. But these kings are still, that was a large force he went against and, and, and took over or defeated. So here's Abram now uh, waiting for them to retaliate. He's gone to battle with them. He's won. But now he knows, are waiting for them to come back on him. And he's waiting on that. God comes to him in a vision. Uh, the word comes to him that God says to him, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be great. We talked about in class this morning, our lesson, our lesson in class this morning was about the widow and the might and how God provides for us. And as I was looking through this and studying and finding the commentary and the different things on this, uh, one of the things that came across here was God knows how to become the answer to our need. When we need a shield or reward, he becomes those things for us. 
Spurgeon says this, If God be our reward, let us take care that we do really enjoy Him. Let us exult in Him, and let us not be pining after any other joy. So as Abram's fearing here, God is telling him, I am your shield. I am your reward. There is nothing to fear. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what, what will you give me for I continue childish, childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So here's Abram. God speaks to him in a vision. His word to him and says, Hey, Abram, do not fear. I am your reward. I am your shield. I've got this cover for you. And what does Abram do? Well, he does what we do. He questions God. He says, Look, Lord, you have tossed me materially. We saw from last week how large his, his household was, uh, what he had in belongings. But the one thing he didn't have was what God promised him from the first. He didn't have a child. He didn't have a descendant. So he's sitting here basically saying, it's kind of like this, again, we talked about this morning, when's enough enough? God made a promise to him of what was going to happen. And Abram's in here going, you know, God, you promised me, but where is it? I have all this money, I have all this material stuff, but my servant, Eleazar was his servant, my servant's going to be my heir. I don't have a fiscal one, so he's going to be my heir. You promised me this stuff. I like this, uh, I saw this sentence in, in, the, in the commentaries I said. It, instead, of holding in it, instead of holding in his frustration, he brought it before God with an honest heart. How many times... Do we just not come to God with an honest heart and go, God, why? What's going on? He knows it already. He is not surprised by anything that happens in our life. Trials, tribulations, sufferings. He knows it all. And that's what Abram's doing. He's not doing it denying God's promises. He's doing it because he desires God's promise. He's doing it because he, he, God... He desires that promise that God gave to him. And he came with an honest heart saying, Look, I don't have any offspring, and a member of my household is going to be there. You promised me this. Coming with an honest frustration is some of us, uh, men sometimes, having an adult conversation with God. Which is fine. We are his children. So he comes with that. And then here's what God says. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram brings, him, brings his frustrations, his desires, his doubts to God. God tells him that he will have an heir, that he will have a son that will come from him. This man should not be your heir. So he's, he's, he's being specific to him now that what I promised you is going to happen. Now, when they're having this conversation, when this is going on, we're still 15 years away from Isaac. See, we live in a world now, uh, and if you don't believe it, get into any fast food line or any uh, checkout counter where we're very impatient, but it takes more than five seconds for something to happen. And some people, you know, you get things in a microwave now, and it says, microwave for 10 seconds. Ten seconds? I don't have ten seconds. 
and we end up being impatient with God like that. As, as we read Scripture and we look at it, you got to remember, look at David, we'll look at Joseph's life. We're going to look at Joseph's life in a, little, in a few months or in a few weeks. Uh, as we turn the pages of Scripture and we read in a few minutes, it's years. There's things that God promises people. He promised David he was going to be king. It was years before David was king. And we get frustrated with God because he says he promises these things, and yet we don't see them, and we're like, okay, God, you promised this. When's it going to happen? You promised this. When's it going to happen? And it's on God's timetable, not ours. So when he makes these promises to Abram, and he's going to be a great nation and all this, he's still 50, we're, at this point, we're still 15 years out from something happening because we're on our timetable and not God's. Hebrews says this, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Ooh, there's that word. Patience. We all have patience, right? about doesn't happen. We need faith and patience to inherit God's promise. Everything happens on His timeline. And He believed the Lord and He counted it to Him as righteousness. We're going to park here for a little bit. He believed in the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. If you remember what Abram's, Abram's done up till now, especially when we looked last week, remember what he's in Egypt, what he did? They told Sarai the dude to lie. Uh, he's not had a good track record so far of doing stuff. So there's essentially two types of righteousness. There's the righteousness that we accomplish by our own efforts, and there's a righteousness accounted to us by the work of God when we believe. None of us are good enough, none of us are good enough to assume or to accomplish perfect righteousness. So we must have God's righteousness accounted to us by doing just what Abram, Abram did. He believed the Lord. Right here in this Verses is the first time we see the word believe as it's used in the Bible, the Hebrew, and the first time we see the word righteousness is used in the Bible is this verse right here. Romans 4, 1 through 3 says this, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then on in chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, or 9 and 10, says this. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? Was he while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised, and that's just talking about uh, uh, something that's coming later. Verses 19 through 24 in chapter 4 says this of Romans, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And in Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. 
Just as Abraham believed God, here we go, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So as we look at this being accounted for righteousness, we certainly can say that the righteousness was not made because of his obedience or fulfillment to any religious law or ritual. It was faith and faith alone that caused God to account that. We, are already, we have already seen his track record. We're going to see in the weeks ahead his track record doesn't get much better. So it's not what Abram did or is going to do, but it's all about God. Found this, I saw this as the faith that made Abram righteous wasn't so much believing in God that he existed, but believing that it was, it was believing God. Those who only believe in God are merely on the same level as demons. James chapter 2, verses 19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. There is one thing different to believing in God, that He exists or there's, there's such a person or such a thing of God, is God, and believing in God. And believing in His character and who He says He is and what His promises say. You have a lot of people who say they believe in God. That's a head knowledge. That's saying you know, there's somebody out there. There's another thing, what Abram's doing, he's believing God. Again, he's 100 years old at this time. They have been married, have had no children. We're going through a process that God's telling him, no, your child's going to be, you're going to have a descendant. And then he tells them to go outside and count the stars. Which, can you go out, is there a possibility to go out and count all the stars? That's one thing I dislike. I mean, as much as I like having uh, artificial light now, having that street light you have, you know, we have one at our house. It makes it easier to get through the house and be outside, and it's really neat. There's times I miss when there's a total darkness, and it's a full, clear night, and you just see, it just seems like the horizon stretches forever. Uh, I know some of the guys, I've never been, but some of the guys used to go to the Outer Banks and fish, and, and the island they went on had no power. So there was no lights, no streets, no nothing. And Fry's talked about it, and Doug and some other guys have talked about it. It just seems like the, the sky stretches forever. And all you see is stars forever, just from, like, from one end to the other. And that's what Abram walked out to. And God said, try to number all of that. Those are your descendants. And because of that, he believed the Lord. This point in time, Abram, Abram and Sarah had not produced a single child. So how was this going to happen? Listen, neither, nevertheless, Abram took God's promise concerning the future and accepted it as an already present reality. This is the definition of faith, a belief in the future so sure and unwavering that we accept it as if it were history. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. According to Hebrews, the definition of saving, of saving faith involves both an object of faith and the content of faith. The object of faith is always the same thing, God's promises. God's promises are sure. He never falters on his promises. The, promise of God, the promises of God hold hope for the future. They ask us to accept something that seems impossible on their face. It has been mentioned here before, and we've had people in this church mention it before and talked about it before. A statement was made that we want something so big to happen that without God it's impossible. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Have you ever prayed that God, if you don't do it, it'll fail? We want something so big to happen that we know you did it and we didn't. Or I didn't. And there's where Abram is here. 
at, fa- at face value, in human terms, it was impossible what God was promising Abram at this point in time. For Abram, the foolish promise was he, was, he received was going to have multiple descendants when he had yet to bear even one child. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 says this, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So here we have the conversation. God tells Abram, I have already taken you out of Ur. I have set you on this path. I have already done things in your presence. And I will continue to do those. And what does Abram do? Oh, Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess this? I like this. It says, though God, has, though God had just accounted Abram as righteous, Abram could still demonstrate some degree of doubt as indicated by the question. thing here says, I believe it when I hear God say it, but five minutes later, I'm not sure. Please prove it to me. That sound like us? I know your promises, God. I know what you say, God. Yeah, but how? When? Especially when? Spurgeon says this, what? It says what? Abraham, is not God's promise sufficient for thee? Our beloved, faith is often marred by a measure of unbelief. Or if not quite unbelief, yet there is a desire to have some token, some sign beyond the bare promise of God. I'm sure you never did this. God, just show me a sign. Lord, I know you probably want me to do this, but if you want me to do this, show me a sign. Do this or do that. So where Abram is, I believe you, Lord. I believe your promise is. But can you at least show me something? Can you, I lost a token, something? At this time, Abram had no title deed to the land. He had no certificate of ownership that another person would recognize. He had nothing to, any, to make anyone believe he actually owned the land, all he had was God's promise. Here we go. So God said to him, he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Uh, so all my hunter friends out there, let's see here, you got uh, a heifer, a goat, and a ram, and you're going to cut them in half. How's that working out? Fry, how would you like to do that? Yeah. Seems a little bit uh, much, does it not? Back in these days, in time it was written, people was written to, context, this is the way two people had a contract. The contract was made by sacrificial cutting of animals they split the carcasses on the ground, the animals are lying on the ground, and the covenant was made when the parties 
to the agreement, walk through the animal parts together. So when God comes to Abram and tells him to get this particular items or particular uh, animals and to cut them and do what he says here, that's like us having it, going down to the lawyer's office to sign a piece of paper of someone. That's how Abram viewed it. Him and God was going to make a covenant. Okay? How do I get this stuff? How's it going to happen? God explains this to him. He goes, okay, we're going to sign a contract together. Right? I remember a long time ago, I, this verse sticks out to me. For some of us, folks that have been here for a while, our church, I remember Tim Pruitt, I don't know if he's on this verse, or it must have been this verse or close to it, actually took some of the hymn books. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but he took the hymn books and made, uh, made a row there here in the, in the front and actually walked through them to show this covenant was getting ready to happen by walking through those books. And we're talking, gosh, 15, probably 12, 15 years ago. Just things like that that stick in your mind about God's covenant and His promise. So here it is. Uh, the word made here, um, he made a covenant, we're getting ready to make a covenant. Actually, the word means, uh, the word made means cut. So basically it means the Lord cut a covenant. So they're getting ready to have to do a covenant. Obviously, the siblings is plain. Uh, this is a covenant so serious it's sealed in blood because the way they did it, it was a trough. So not only was there blood in the fact of killing the animals, cutting them in half, but the blood drained to the trough, so when they walked through it, it was sealed in blood. Let's see how serious the covenant was. So when he had his doubts, this is let's sign a contract and settle this for all. It's what God told him. You want to know about a promise? You want to know about the covenant? We'll have a covenant. And when the birds of prey came down to the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So again, here's the thing. God tells Abram to do this. God tells him to prepare this, uh, these animals and this stuff to, to, to do the covenant. And then what happens? God doesn't show up right away. He didn't show up on Abram's timetable. So as Abram's waiting on God, what does Abram have to do? He's chasing the birds of prey away. He's chasing the vultures away or the crows or whatever else is showing up. So he's, he's keeping them away, waiting for God to appear to complete the covenant ceremony. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain, listen, here's the promise, here's the covenant. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete." So here's the promise God makes. You're going to have offspring. You're going to have descendants, Abram, and they're going to be sojourners. They're going to be in a land that's not theirs, and they're going to be servants, and they're going to be afflicted for 400 years. How's the promise working so far? Here's the promise to you. Here's what's going to happen to your descendants. Sometimes God's blessings are not what we want them to be. Um, I think Laura Story did the song uh, about God's blessings, how blessings in disguise. Uh, I think at the time her husband was going through cancer and cancer treatment, uh, talking about uh, sometimes God's blessings are in disguise. What we think is hardships, what we think is suffering, what we think is trials is really God's blessings. 
Because this is not a blessing, folks. I'm sorry. God's come to you and told you you're going to be, uh, you're going to have descendants, and you're going to have some descendants uh, that's too numerous that you can't even count, like the stars. And then he goes, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, they're going to be uh, strangers for a while in a land that's not theirs, and they're going to be afflicted for 400 years. Doesn't sound like much of a blessing right there, does it? But then God says, I'll bring the judgment on that nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. The Amorites uh, were a group of people. Uh, uh, God actually gave them 400 years to repent. He gave them 400 years before he had the Israelites come in to do that because he's a God of patience and a God of mercy. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenesites, I love these mites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Rephraim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, we know who they are, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. you got to love these people. God's put Abram to a deep sleep. Right? He shows them this vision. He tells them this stuff. When the covenant is made, there is only one per person walking through the covenant. And that's God. Abram had nothing to do with this covenant. This was a unilateral covenant that God made with himself that he was going to keep his promise to Abram. Smoke and fire pot and a flaming torch. Obviously, we know there's that from Scripture. Uh, Exodus 13, 21 through 22 talks about a, uh, the pillar of cloud in the wilderness. Smoke on Mount Sinai. That's Exodus 19, uh, 18. Uh, as a cloud of God, Shania, glory in, the, in First Kings. And then, of course, the, born, the burning torch or the flaming torch we see is the pillar of fire. God represented by the smoking, the smoking pot and the burning torch passed through the animal parts by himself. Okay? By himself. It was a unilateral covenant. Abram never signed it. He looked passively while God signed it for both of them. Therefore, the certainty of the covenant God made with Abram is based on who God is, not who Abram is or what Abram would do. This covenant could not fail because God cannot fail. That's us. The Father walked through the, he walked through the broken and bloody body of Jesus to establish his covenant with us. And God signed it for both of us. We merely enter to that covenant by faith. We don't make the covenant. So the same covenant that's shown here with the animals as a shadow of the covenant God made on the cross. With Jesus' broken and bloody body, he made a covenant. The covenant he made here was almost in a sense of God saying, if I don't keep my word, let me put asunder. He put his deity on the line with this covenant. Every generation of faith is based on the content of a promise they have received. Adam received the promise that the woman would become the mother of a seed to defeat the enemy. Noah believed the promise that a coming flood would destroy the earth. Abram received the promise of an inheritance and descendants. 
The content changes, but the object doesn't. Saving faith today follows the same pattern. We are saved today by grace through faith. The faith we have is today is based on the same promise in God's Word, just like Abram. Our faith has an object, too, and a content. The object is the same. We have a faith in God's promises concerning a future. The content of our faith is a promise concerning Jesus. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9-12 through 12 says this, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself. The one who does not believe God has made Him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So the Father has testified concerning Jesus that he is the Son of God, and He is the one who died for our sins. The Bible teaches us the same salvation started in Genesis until the end of Revelation. We cannot earn our righteousness, but we can be accredited as righteous by God who is rich in mercy. We will never, ever, ever earn our salvation. We'll work it out. We'll be sanctified and closer to Jesus. But our salvation comes from God. His promise to us on the cross. That should bring us quite a bit of freedom. I am a very works-oriented person. And if I'm not very careful sometimes, if we're not careful, but if I'm not very careful sometimes, I get bogged down in... Uh, just stupid things I do sometimes and things that happen and just like oh, what but it's not my promise it's God's promise he loves me in spite of myself I guess there is a There is great freedom in thinking about that, though, that we can't do anything that God won't love us. There is nothing we can do that He will not love us unconditionally with mercy and grace always. Matt Chandler was talking this morning when he was watching a men's group that when we fail and we struggle and, we, and things happen to us, God leans into us. Think about that. He leans into us in our trials and our sufferings. He leans into us and He pursues us. Because the covenant is His, not ours. The covenant He made is with Him, not us. And we are credited with Christ's righteousness when we accept those promises. We are considered righteous and holy and robed in white in God's eyes because of Christ's sacrifice. We are a holy priesthood. Adam sinned when he heard a promise from God but did not act in the accordance with faith in that word. God promised that eating of the tree of knowledge that would bring death but Adam didn't believe his word and fell into sin. Today, God has determined that righteousness will be restored on the basis of faith and a promise. Lack of faith in God's first promise brought spiritual death, so now he has decreed that a demonstration of faith in God's final promise in Christ is the requirement for eternal life. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's it. 
But again, there is great freedom in there. Our works are never going to get us there. Our righteousness is never going to get us there. And we doesn't have to. He loves us. He, he, he took the covenant upon himself so we could be free and by faith in that promise have eternal life.